Genesis chapter 46, and I was coming very close in preparation to reading 46 right three quarters of the way through 47, which would be in keeping with recent weeks, wouldn't it? (coughs) But the first seven verses of chapter 46 most certainly claimed attention. So our main study is these first seven verses, but we'll take note of what is said about the descendants of Jacob uh, right down to verse 27. Genesis chapters 46 and 47 are concerned with Jacob's coming to Egypt. Not just Jacob, of course, but in Jacob, the whole chosen family come to Egypt, and there they prosper. They prosper because it is God's will that they should not only survive, but grow, and grow towards becoming a nation. I thought that when we approach these chapters tonight, this is what we would be studying. But what I found was that the Holy Spirit will not allow us to consider Jacob coming to Egypt until we have considered Jacob leaving Canaan. And these first seven verses of chapter 46 are concerned with just that, Jacob leaving Canaan. And these first seven verses with their very practical teaching, very sharp application, are what we're going to confine ourselves to in God's Word tonight. What you have before you then is quite obvious in the first place. You have seven verses which tell us of the preparations Jacob made for leaving Canaan. Now, if that is obvious, then the significance is not so obvious. And yet these verses are deeply significant because they reveal two things. They reveal, firstly, Jacob's mind and heart. And they reveal, secondly, his faith and the progress of obedience that is going on through faith, not only in him, but in the patriarchs. Two things. Jacob's mind and heart, and Jacob's faith. So first of all then, Jacob's mind and heart. Now of all the places to go, before leaving the land of promise. Places of deep personal significance to Jacob. Bethel, Peniel. Why then did he go to Beersheba? Now, what we know of Beersheba gives us the answer. You would only need to turn to chapter 28 and remind yourself as you did so that it was from there that he started out leaving the land of Canaan for Haran the first time he left to know that this was a significant place for Jacob. You would only need to remind yourself that this is the place which became his father Isaac's base and his center in the land, to know that it was therefore his home within his homeland. You would only need to remind yourself also that this is the place where his grandfather, Abraham, exercised his faith in the covenant promise of God, to know that this was to Jacob's mind and heart his base. And when he comes to Bethel, rather, when he comes to Beersheba, how does he address God? Look at the words. He addresses God as the God of his father, Isaac. He is looking for continuity. He is looking for abiding truth. He is looking for something that is locked into and founded in the covenant mercy of God. He is addressing his God and his father here. What is he doing in Beersheba? 
He is touching base. Something you and I need to do, not only from time to time as we tend to, but almost constantly. Because touching base for Jacob was also seeking God. And he's not only seeking God, he is asking for God's guidance. Put simply, he is asking God, can I do this again? Have I your permission to leave Canaan once more? Here is the land of promise, he might have said to God, and I am drawing on towards my death, although he had 17 years to live. And he's saying, oh God, have I your permission to leave this place? And to put it even more simply, what he is doing is, he is seeking God's will in God himself. And is this not exactly what we must do? And is this not exactly what we need to do above everything else we need to do when we are of the opinion that God is moving us on in one way or any other? Do we not need to touch base? Do we not need to seek God and in seeking God seek His guidance? And His will. And I want to pause here in our studies tonight. Slow everything down because we've been going at a great speed for some weeks now. But pause here in order to think about these things. Touching base. Seeking God. And His will. But we still have not answered the question in any particular way. What question? The question, why did he stop? And why did he turn aside at Beersheba? Now think about his circumstances. His whole family, his tribe as they are becoming, are in danger of death. They are suffering with the rest of Canaan and the Near East from famine. And here they are offered escape. And surely what he should do is go immediately and grasp this opportunity. Surely all he needed to do was to say, this must be from God, and go. But he doesn't. Now add to that that his beloved son, his long lost beloved Joseph, is alive and has called him and asked him to come immediately down to Egypt And yet he does not. He stops. He pauses. He goes to Beersheba. He touches base. He seeks God. Think also of this, that he is being offered what he did not think he would have, a blessed old age and a quiet death. Why then stop and turn aside to Beersheba? Now to anyone who loves the Lord, the answer is clear, the answer is plain. To anyone who seriously wants to serve God and is seeking His will above their own or anyone else's, His will for their lives, the answer is easy to see. And the answer is that He does not want to be betrayed by his own heart, into stepping out of God's will. He does not want to part company with God. That's what it's about. He does not want to miss his calling. Even in his old age, he will not miss his calling. And he will not jeopardize the covenant purposes of God and God's saving plan. And you see now why I put together these two things, that it not only reveals his mind and heart, but his faith. They belong together. He turns aside and looks for God. And God did respond to Jacob's need. And did respond to Jacob's search. And God spoke to him as he'd spoken to him before in a vision of the night. 
as he'd spoken to him at Bethel and wrestled with him at Peniel. God spoke his word to Jacob. And I want you to think again of what was said. I am God. The God of your father. Now let's break this down. That's the first thing God said. What then did he go on to say? Secondly, he said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make of you a great nation. Thirdly, he said, I will go down with you to Egypt and bring you up again. And then lastly, and you might even think this is not so important and miss it, but it is important, he says, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Now, friends, let's look at these four things. I am God, the God of your father. Oh, how badly Jacob needed to hear this. It wasn't Beersheba, the place that is that Jacob longed for, but the God that he'd grown up to know and love there. Not only the God of his father Isaac, but the God whom he had made his own, his God. That's who his heart was yearning for. And he needed to hear these words, I am God. Here is your rock, Jacob. Here is the very foundation of your soul. Here is the anchor for the storm. Here is where you will find my will and your way forward. I am God, the God of your Father. Friends, this is how it must be for us when we need to touch base. It's not a matter of place. It's a matter of person. It's God we need. And it's His voice we need to hear saying to us, I am God, I am still here, I am your God, as I was with Abraham and Isaac, I am with you, I am God. When we need to touch base, what we really need, of course, is to come before God and hear these words so that we too can be quietly confident that it is not our will that we are satisfying, but His will. Without that personal contact and fellowship with God in His Holy Spirit, we cannot be sure that we are fulfilling God's will. With it, we can. So that we can see that what at first appears to be a break is in fact continuity. You see, Jacob needed to see this. And he did see it. He needed to see that leaving Canaan was not leaving God's will, but going on in God's will. He needed to see that this was not a break, but continuity. And the continuity was not in the place, but in the person of God. He needed to see that ultimately the way into Canaan led out of it. That the way out of Canaan was the way into nationhood. And the way on in God's purpose, paradoxically, led through leaving the land of promise. The place he'd always known. The place he'd left and longed to return to. The place which was focused in Beersheba. It wasn't a break. It was true continuity. That's what we need to see. That when God's will appears to us to be a matter of a break, if it is God's will, it is not. It is continuity. I am God. The God of your Father. Therefore, God says... Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there 
Not here in Canaan, you see, but there I will make of you a great nation. And of course, Jacob would no pass down through his father the words that were spoken to his grandfather, a promise for the future and for the birth of the nation. Do you remember this? I'm referring to the great covenant in chapter 15. If you want to glance back at it, look it up quickly, friends. It's chapter 15, verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, perhaps you remember this, the Lord said to Abram, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in the land, not theirs. You see, now God is saying, and that is Egypt. And they will be slaves there. It will get worse. And they will be oppressed there. It will get worse still. For 400 years, it will seem to go on forever, God says. But I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve. And afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. And that will be the possession above all of their nationhood. And so now God says to Jacob as he comes back to Beersheba, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. There I will make this great nation of you. And he's saying to Jacob, remember the covenant. Remember the promise to your grandfather which is also yours. This promise now I am recalling and affirming. Oh, but you'll notice how specific it's now becoming. God who has given this foundational assurance to Jacob, I am God, now gives him the detail he needs to go out and obey him. Don't be afraid to go to Egypt. God knows us. And God knows that while we find our rock in His being, our confidence, our true and everlasting confidence in the rock of Christ, God knows that we also need daily guidance. God understands the daily reality of following Him in a world full of doubts. And that's why it begins here, do not be afraid. Recently in our studies in the book of Acts, we counted the number of times it says in the Bible, do not be afraid. And we got two different totals and the two different times we did it. You could always get different totals because in different ways it said so many times, do not be afraid, God says. Do not be afraid, Jesus says to us. Because He knows our hearts. He knows that we're like Jacob. He knows that as well as knowing that he is sure and certain in his control, that we need also a glimpse of his purposes day to day. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, he said to Jacob. Don't be afraid to lead this people, he said to Moses. Don't be afraid to be king of Israel, he said to David. Don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, he said to Joseph. Don't be afraid of those who oppose you, Jesus said to his disciples. And don't be afraid of death itself. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. I am the God of your Father. Don't be afraid to go. And the third thing, and I think this is at the very heart of it, this is the core of it, this is the essence of it, The third thing God says, I will go down with you to Egypt. Is that also the heart of the matter for you, my friend? You see, what you have here is the being of God. I am God, the God of your Father. Here you not only have the being of God, you have the promise of God. There I will make you a great nation. But it's not just God's being and God's promise. You also have God's peace. Do not be afraid. But these three things, the being and the promise and the peace of God, are ours and only ours. Will you notice this, please? With God's presence. I will go with you with the person of God, with the personal presence of God. 
Why is it that God said to Moses, I will be with you? Why is it that he said to Joseph, to Joshua rather, as I was with Moses, so I am with you? Why is it that he did the same with Elisha following Elijah? Why is it that Jesus said to his disciples and through them to us, I am with you always? It's because this is the essence of God's will going on in the presence of God. I want to share with you tonight that I am drawn always, and especially in these recent years, I am drawn to the great example of this that I find towards the end of the life of Moses. And I'm referring to Exodus chapter 33, and perhaps you would look with me very briefly at that. It's where Moses, chapter 33 of Exodus, Moses at verse 12 says to the Lord, See, thou sayest to me, bring up this people, But thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. I don't know who's going to go. How many will come with me? What if there's a rebellion? And who's going to support me? Yet thou hast said, I know you by name. And you have also found favor in my sight. You'll notice that twice Moses quotes this, finding favor in God's sight, and twice God quotes it back to him. Now therefore I pray thee as I have found favor in thy sight, show me now thy ways, that I may know thee and find favor in thy sight. Now, so far he's asking for God's guidance. But Moses has come to know that that guidance cannot be separated from God's presence. Consider too, he says, that this nation is thy people. And God said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. But Moses said to him, If thy presence will not go with me, do not carry us up from here. Oh, friends, on a personal level, I really don't have the heart tonight to be able to share with you what that means to me. What does it mean to you? You see, if the first great move in the infant family of Israel was out of Canaan into Egypt, then the next great move was back out of Egypt and to Canaan. And as God said to Jacob, I am with you, I will go down with you to Egypt, so Moses is conscious of the fact that he needs the presence of God, and he says, if thy presence will not go with me, do not carry us up from here. And this is Jacob's great cry too. And this must be the cry of everyone who wishes to go on in God's service. This is the essence. If thy presence will not go with me, don't take us up there. And I was called to this congregation. This is where I found sanity and peace to do what seemed impossible. I will go with you. I hope someday to be able to preach on this passage, my friends, but do you see how it is a great example? And I want to also say this to you, that not only is it of the essence when we are speaking of God's guidance, but it's of the essence in terms of our personal discipleship. Do you know, friends, what you learn What you come to know, even what you believe, leaves a mark on you, but it is nothing, nothing beside the mark of the people you live with and you love. 
And God's presence leaves a distinctive mark on us. And I, for one, have never been attracted, have never found people attractive who have got their doctrine all sorted out and know a lot about theology and about God, but do not show the marks of His presence in their lives, the marks of grace. The presence of God leaves a mark on us. God said to Jacob, I will go down with you. And the last thing is the thing, as I said, we so easily miss where he says to Jacob, Look, Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. You know, we've been speaking tonight thus far about great and mighty things. Personal, yes, but great and mighty. But here we have something that is infinite, that is intimate rather. The care and understanding God shows for Jacob's needs. Your own beloved son will close your eyes when you die, he is saying. The son you thought you had lost and I restored to you. The one I chose to send through a death experience to give life to you and to your family and to the nation to come. He'll close your eyes. And God does minister to us, you know, through our loved ones. But also Jacob knew through this word that the promise would go on. Oh, it's all so personal. Did you notice the words, Jacob, Jacob? Isn't that like God calling for Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden? Isn't it like God calling the young boy, Samuel, Samuel? Isn't it like God calling to Abraham at the time of the giving of the covenant? Oh, Abraham, calling by name. Isn't it like Jesus saying, Oh, Simon, Simon, God cares. God knows and understands our hearts and cares. Now, friends, what I've said before you is Jacob's mind and heart. But do you recall we said there were two things? The second thing revealed in this passage of seven verses is Jacob's faith. Very briefly, we'll look at that before we close. I want you just to think of the fact, and it is a fact, that this is not the first time that a patriarch has left Canaan to go to Egypt in a time of famine. Listen to these words from chapter 12. There was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. But my friends, we are meant to see that there is a great contrast now. A contrast in faith. Because Abraham, for all his faith in God as it grew, at that stage in his life acted without faith. We saw that he went to Egypt in chapter 12 without a word of prayer, without seeking God's will, without touching base, without seeking God's presence. And because he did not seek God and God's will, he went straight into temptation. And under temptation, he fell and nearly ruined the purposes of God, if he ever could. You see, Jacob had permission. Abraham did not even ask permission to leave Canaan and go to Egypt. He simply did it. And here's the temptation to go on in our own will and then conveniently label it as God's. Do what we want and then call it God's will and say, well, I prayed about it. Yes, but did God answer? Jacob, for all his character weaknesses, and he's got plenty as we've seen, including his grandfather's tendency to be a little economical with the truth. In fact, Jacob was a trickster. Nevertheless, has learned to seek and hear and heed 
and obey God's will. And in the midst of the falterings and failings of this chosen family, what we see then is spiritual progress. And you know, this is something we should look for in ourselves in the midst of our falterings and our failings. And we still fail God. We need to ask God to show us that we are going on with Him and help us to do so. Now, friends, there is so much more here that we could almost stay until next Lord's Day. Don't worry, I'm not going to. But let me just indicate a few as we close. Did you notice also what he did when he came to Beersheba? Jacob offered sacrifice to God. It's not that he needed God's approval. It's not that he had to purchase God's will with a sacrifice. Before he could ever come, he had to make sacrifice. But it's that Jacob had to come to God and to come to God in the right frame of mind, to come to God humbly and in worship, which is why tonight, because we are dealing with God's will and guidance, we prayed at the start of this sermon. He sacrificed in order to meet with God, to hear God's word of guidance and assurance and love and comfort. And God, you know, has appointed a way for us to approach Him. It's not through sacrifice, but through one great and final sacrifice. It's through Jesus Christ who is the truth, the life, and the way. And we notice that. We notice also that we've spoken of the personal presence of God. And you know, God deals with Jacob in an intensely personal way. Uh, some of the scholars have pointed out to us in this passage the interplay between I and you. And perhaps if you just glanced at the paragraph again, verses 1 to 7, you'll see the words I and you, I and you over again. Some of the scholars point us to the original language and show us that there's great depth here in the difference between the singular and thine, including everyone, as we have it in the authorized version. Because revelation is always within a, revelation, a relationship to God. Let me say that again. Revelation is always within a relationship to God. But we simply notice that and note also that God's promise and God's presence go together here. But they're not tied to one locality or to one generation in time. And as God had promised four centuries of exile to Abraham, so Jacob had to leave the land only with the promise of return after his death, and it would be long after his death. And that means, my friends, that God's will is our place of service. Whatever that will be and wherever it takes us, God's will shall indicate our Canaan, even if the way to Canaan is through our Egypt. So what is God saying tonight to you and to me? Now, in our present circumstances, I am not trying to tell you exactly what our next step should be. I stand accused of that, but I've truly sought not to. And I ask you simply to believe that. But you know, we are seeking God's will and God's way forward. And I hope you do not hear something that is not being said tonight if I tell you that what is set before you are the principles of going on in God's will. They are three. One, touch base. Two, listen to God's word. Three, seek the Lord's presence. Touch base. Seek God. Seek His will. 
Seek it humbly. Seek it in worship. Seek it through Christ Jesus and His great sacrifice. But touch base. Seek God. Listen to His Word. But what else are we trying to do now? I tell you, if we do listen, then I'm sure that in that word there will come a word of assurance. I am God, the God of your Father. Do not be afraid to go wherever. I'm sure he will give us specific guidance as he did to Jacob. Go to Egypt. I'm sure he will give us personal assurance. Joseph shall close your eyes. You shall be cared for. Touch base. Listen to God's word. And above all in this, seek the Lord's presence. I will go with you, said the Lord. Friends, Egypt would mean more than peace and preservation. It was a place of temporary peace. It was the place where the nation were preserved for the future. But it was also a place of strife and suffering in its latter stages. But I tell you this, and I tell you it with all my heart engaged, that we are better in Egypt in trouble and separated from God in Canaan. You remember someone standing in this pulpit not so many years ago and saying to you, rather be in the boat in the storm with Jesus than safe on the shore without Him. God is faithful. Christ is faithful. Whatever is God's will and way for us, what we seek to hear is God's word saying, Go, and I will be with you. We are seeking God's will. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that you have not left us wondering as to who and what you are and what your purposes should be for us. We thank you that we see you in Christ Jesus our Lord, that we have the promise of his presence with us always, even to the end of the age. And as at this time we continue to seek your way and will, the way forward in that will, Lord, Open up our path and show us clearly what shall be next. For Jesus' sake, Amen.